The uh, spring of 1949, that's uh, 62 years ago, uh, uh, brought two major milestones, one for John Siegenthaler and one for me. In March uh, of 1949, uh, John Siegenthaler walked into the newsroom of the Tennessean right here in Nashville and uh, took his first job as a cub reporter. And the next month, in April of 1949, 62 years ago, I was born. <laughs> so it, it launched his career, it launched my, my life. Uh, John's career as a journalist at the Tennessean uh, went on for 43 years. Uh, he took uh, a brief uh, time out in the early 1960s to, the, to be the administrative assistant to then Attorney General Kennedy, and he represented uh, the President and the Justice Department in trying to be supportive of and protective of the Freedom Riders in Montgomery, Alabama in the early 1960s at the height of the Civil Rights uh, struggle. Uh, John was uh, critically injured when he was attacked by a group of Klansmen in Montgomery while he was trying to uh, save uh, a, a woman from that, from that mob. Uh, thankfully, he recovered, uh, and when he left the Kennedy administration, he then returned uh, to the Tennessean. His career there, uh, uh, he eventually became the editor of the Tennessean, as well as the publisher, uh, and uh, because he didn't have enough to do, uh, when Al Newharth dreamed up the idea of USA Today, he asked uh, John would he be willing to be the first editorial. I think uh, John did, uh, did his USA Today duties, I think Sunday through Thursday, and then I think he would show up here on, uh, on Fridays and Saturdays and uh, oversee the Tennessee, and I don't know how he did it, it was extraordinary. Uh, when, uh, when John retired from the uh, Gannett Company, from the Tennessee and from USA Today, that was in 1991, was it, John? Uh, it was our good fortune that he joined the Freedom Forum and has been, since 1991, been the driving force behind our First Amendment work of this organization. And the First Amendment, as I mentioned this morning, is at the foundation of everything we do uh, at the Freedom Forum. Uh, this building, of course, is named for John in his beloved uh, hometown of, of Nashville. Uh, he is... Uh, one of three founders, it's only we, we have three people who have founder status in our organization. Uh, Al Newhart, that's the founder of the Freedom Forum. Uh, John Quinn, uh, the former editor-in-chief of USA Today, who is the founder of the Chips Quinn Scholars Program, our, our most enduring diversity program. And then John, the founder of our, our First Amendment Center. Um, while he was uh, uh, editor, of, uh, and publisher of uh, the Tennessee, and he also became uh, president of the leading uh, professional trade organization for editors in this country, AS&E, uh, and uh, had an incredible career that continues to this day. It's our privilege to, uh, to welcome John Thank Siegenthal. Thank you very much, Jack. <laughs> One thing about getting old, you get applause before you open your mouth. <laughs> I thank you very much for that. Um, the question as I listen, Jack, uh, is what in this environment, um, given why you're here, uh, would a twice retired 84-year-old journalist have anything to say of relevance or Meaning, uh, I know you heard Bill Talent, and I've heard him, and um, so I know the direction you're on. I look back uh, maybe 25 years, and I remember that everybody in journalism education was saying to newspaper editors uh, like me, you better get online, that's where the future is, that's where it's going. Um, and of course, they were right. 
I now talk to editors and publishers, and they are saying about journalism communication schools, uh, we're here, but the people they're sending us really aren't equipped to do it all. And the nature uh, of the beast of the media is that journalists coming in and staying in must do it all. My son and I, yesterday, my son John for a dozen years was um, weekend anchor for NBC News. And um, yesterday we went up to Western Kentucky <coughs> University and, and talked about journalism across two generations. And I was fascinated by the young people in there. We sort of began by asking, we were before two really large classes, um, almost 100 in each one. We began by asking them questions. Where do you get your news? Well, you know where they get their news. Uh, they get it online. But where online? Um, we asked about Facebook, and all but two students raised their hands. Yeah, they Twitter and they dig. Um, but Facebook uh, is, uh, is where they most often go, they said. And we asked some of them to talk to us about it. Uh, I naturally uh, asked, how many of you rely on Wikipedia as a reliable resource? <laughs> and, um, and two of them raised their hands. Uh, now, you know, I, I think they're lying in front of their professor, but, uh, but I do believe that fewer and fewer of them are using um, Wikipedia as a, as a first reliable, reliable source. I think my son and I came away late in the day uh, very encouraged by not only their answers, but their questions. Um, and it just convinces me, again, that um, <coughs> we're confronting a um, period in journalism when the opportunities <coughs> are so very great. Uh, I, I can't think of a time, Jack says, I, Got that first job uh, in 1949. I mean, my uncle was an executive of the paper. I was a child of nepotism. <laughs> but I, I came into it um, and throughout it took full advantage of First Amendment rights and values. Um, and as I listened to those children yesterday and, and last night and asked them questions and heard their questions, they know where they are. And you would think, given what's happened to the newspaper industry, there would be a fall off in enrollment in journalism school. You'd think of the fractionalization of, of audiences for television news programs. You'd think um, a diminution of interest in journalism. These students know where the future lies, and they are there. And how many of you read newspapers? Well, uh, three or four raised their hands, and then a few more, uh, they read the school newspaper. Uh, and then a few of them said, well, you know, absolutely, I read the daily news here online. Um, we really don't know yet uh, how many, what that audience is for online journalism. I wrote my first piece for the Tennessean <coughs> uh, last year. I wrote two back-to-back -back pieces. There was a woman, uh, first woman in 120 years on death row uh, at Tennessee State Prison, 
And <clears throat> I went out and talked to her with her lawyers, um, not uh, as a journalist, but simply because I've been a long time opponent of the death penalty, and I thought maybe there was uh, there was something to be gained uh, for me and for her by going out and listening. And I came away convinced that there was a great story here. Um, she had her husband killed. And she got uh, a death sentence. A few months before I went to see her, a woman in Tennessee shot her husband in the back while he was sleeping in bed, took their two children, uh, went to the beach with the weapon, and she got two months in a mental institution, and she's now free and working and has custody of her children. And I thought that dichotomy was worth the story, and then I went into it a little more deeply, and something over 20 women who either had killed their husbands, paid to kill their husbands, same sort of situation, and none of them got death, all but two out on parole, uh, and both those two are, enti are entitled to parole. So I s went to the paper and talked to one of the line editors and talked to the reporter, and they showed him a real interest, and then after a few weeks, uh, no interest. Uh, there was no real willingness to uh, put this case against the other cases and raise questions about uh, the consistency of the administration of justice. Uh, this crime was no more heinous than any one of their crimes. Uh, indeed, uh, the most vicious of the killings that I reviewed involved a woman who was a medical doctor who's now out practicing medicine again in another city under her maiden name. But so I thought it was, I thought it had the making of a story. And as I said, they showed interest, but that interest didn't go up the line. And finally, the uh, editorial page editor called me on the phone and said, I've been listening to these conversations. I think if you wrote the story, it would get in. And so I decided to do it, and I did it. I wrote a couple of stories. And I only tell you that story <coughs> To say this, the most gratifying thing about it was the online response that came immediately. I mean, there's no sitting around waiting a week or 10 days for a letter to the editor to come in. I've had people knocking my ass off within 30 seconds. <laughs> <after it was. laughs> And, and, and it, you know, and, and, a, lo and a good deal of um, enthusiasm and praise from some people. But, uh, you know, there's, there he is again, old liberal singing all he never saw an inmate. He thought I'd be in the penitentiary. And, well, you know, it, it, it sort of says something to you about where people, where people are. Um, I don't know how many people, and I'm sure most um, most newspapers don't know how many people um, are on reading their online publications. Um, but I know I had a response of more than 200 people in the day after the first one, and at least that many again the second, when the second article ran a, a week later. It says something to me about um, about where the future is, and putting that together with yesterday and those really bright young students who decided journalism is the way they're going to go, really, it, it really ch chills you and thrills you when you think about uh, the future of journalism, the future of news, and where I was and where they are. Uh, my son and I do this a uh, little conversation across two generations of journalists. And uh, he's heavily into social media now and really he's become quite, um, he's become uh, in his own business, he's now doing media consulting, public relations. And um, 
I asked him whether he was signed, uh, 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 surprised at the number of students who jumped to say Facebook's where we get most of our news. Um, and it was in both classes and enormous. You know, you talk to them about it and then we talked to him a little bit about, about Wikipedia uh, and about other, um, other pub, uh, online postings that um, in my mind create problems. I mean, you probably know about Wikipedia. They said that I uh, was a suspect uh, the five-sentence biography, uh, it went off about five years ago that I had uh, been suspected of assassinating both President Kennedy and Bobby, and that it affected the Soviet Union for 13 years uh, after the second assassination. Um, and I thought, you know, maybe I have enough investigative reporting skills to find out who did that. And I tried and um, didn't get anywhere with it. I finally wrote a piece in USA Today and I was inundated by emails and faxes and telephone calls um, from people who had had the same thing happen to them. Um, and that was one reaction to the piece. The other reaction was that Wikipedia just, it was just a flood of assaults on me uh, as a result uh, of the article I wrote, in which I said Wikipedia is not necessarily a reliable first resource for information. I mean, it was vicious. Uh, the last one was a year ago March, uh, and they said I had raped Jacqueline Kennedy. And, uh, you know, not, no allegation, I did it. Uh, since I've had a confrontation with Jimmy Wales, uh, the founder of Wikipedia, I had talked to him uh, personally in the past by telephone and emailed him and we had had that chat back and forth and then I'd been against him a couple of times on uh, television, NPR. And but after the last confrontation, uh, it's clear that he has some sort of block in because virtually nothing goes up now and never anything that's negative. And in his defense, he's made some efforts to clean up Wikipedia's act. But, but the point is that this marvelous new world of technology holds out such great opportunity for the future of news and journalists, um, you know, the world's at your fingertips. And uh, you can explore the world or you can contribute the knowledge of the world as a journalist. And it's so exciting. And still you know there is this undercurrent um, that's being brought on by a whole um, a whole series of um, critical attacks, irresponsible attacks, uh, negative attacks. Now, as a First Amendment advocate, it never occurred to me that I would sue Wikipedia. <laughs> I found the First Amendment said I shouldn't sue anybody for saying something bad about them. And I could have, um, I could have found out by filing a Jane or John Doe libel suit, but Wikipedia is immune to libel. All online, as you know, information service providers are protected by Section 230 Communications Decency Act, which separates uh, online information service providers under the law from the way uh, broadcasters or publishers are um, dealt with by defamation actions. There is, there was no defamation action that could have been brought about, um, brought against Wikipedia. And if you look at the body of law that's developing, 
you'll find that there are a number of cases now that have been brought uh, in which the courts have said, um, if you go after the original author, fine, but not the information sub uh, uh, service provider. I mean, you, uh, the protection there is absolute. The first case I looked at involved a woman in Los Angeles who's an actress. Her stage name is Chase Masterson. You may have seen her on Star Trek or some of the soaps, and her real name's Carafano, and um, this is not Wikipedia, it just makes the point that, uh, that there, are, there is the opportunity to offend and, um, and to defame, um, available to many different information and service providers. Chase Masterson um, did not put her name on a dating board. Uh, she was not uh, love lost. Um, but Metro Splash in Los Angeles has a dating board. And her name showed up, her stage name, her home address, her business address, um, her email numbers, her email address, um, even a cell phone number, and then her physical measurements, and then in very explicit and um, mean-spirited terms, her sexual preferences. And she didn't know anything about it until suddenly she's inundated by these phone calls. And some are salacious and some of serious inquiries for a date. And she decided to sue Metro Splash. And the court said, look, and, 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 and Metro Splash had not originated it. The person who originated it, it came from an anonymous source in Germany. Uh, and she couldn't find out who that source was. Filed a suit, couldn't trace it. So she sues Metro Splash and, and the court in that case, as it has said uh, in maybe 30 cases or more since, I haven't checked in the last three months, but it was more than 30 cases then, court said, reprehensible as this is to Ms. Carafano, it's protected by Section 230. I only dwell on that um, irresponsibility that's protected by the law uh, to say that the old traditional values of journalism that deal with accuracy and uh, fairness and depth. Um, that's what still is taught in journalism and mass comm schools. And those values remain. And somehow those values must be translated to this world of new technology. Um, why? Uh, you know, whenever I speak on the First Amendment, I love to quote Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, our most eloquent spokesman on that subject. But there was another one of the founders who said something that's relevant now. Alexander Hamilton, I mean, they had tried to put the Bill of Rights in the original Constitution, and he was against it, and James Madison was against it. So they turned George Mason away, who suggested it. And then two years later, they realized their mistake, and there was a demand for it, and they came back. Yeah, but, but while they were in the convention, Hamilton said, and this is a quote, whatever fine words about freedom of the press are inserted to a constitution, it will altogether depend, and these are his words, on public opinion and the general spirit of the people and the country. And we have this First Amendment building, and, uh, and it was created to raise dialogue and debate about the values that are so dear. And those values, I think, are threatened um, by those who don't understand the true worth and true potential and 
and true richness that's there online for us. Uh, public opinion and the general spirit of the people and the government. Uh, government's very tough for us right now. Online, anywhere. Uh, lack of responsibility is right there. I mean, WikiLeaks Wiki uh, comes out. I mean, it's, it's not much different than Daniel Ellsberg, except the way of communicating it uh, is online, as opposed to, as Ellsberg did, handed out by hand. I mean, it's the same case. And I think in both instances, it's protected speech. Sure. It upsets people. Sure. You can make an argument for irresponsibility. Sure, if somebody's life is threatened or loses his life as a result of it, there's potential for prosecution. But irresponsibility is protected by the amendment. And so I really will close this rambling monologue with the suggestion that those of you who are here on a cutting edge of the future of American journalism. We're going through a new rebirth. Uh, and it's happened again and again with <coughs> the evolution of new technology since, since Gutenberg. Uh, I wasn't around when Gutenberg was, but, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's been a continuum. The challenges still have to be made more forcefully and more directly, I think, than they have to be than they have been made in the past. They must be they must begin in, in schools at the earliest level, not journalism school, communication school, elementary school. Responsibility in communication is vital to the future and the viability uh, and the great potential of this resource. I just close by saying I think the future of American journalism, in the hands of those students I was with yesterday, in your hands. Um, it's been a rich past. It can be a richer future. Uh, but to make it that, we have to understand uh, that Hamilton was right. If we lose the public opinion, if we lose the general spirit of the people in the country, if, if the government that gave it to us uh, thinks there is no hope for credibility in it, uh, we're in deep trouble. And so I know I'm preaching to the choir, but the responsibility and the credibility um, that you bring to what you do uh, is going to make a great future for this new technology. And with that, I think I'll quit. Thank you very much. Sure, if anybody has one. Yeah. Do you use Facebook? Are you on Facebook, John? I was on Facebook. But you know, everybody who went after me on Wikipedia, um, it was more trouble than it was worth, more angering <laughs> than it was worth. And um, so I don't do it. I, I don't, uh, I'm not on Facebook anymore. I, it was hard to get out once you got in, but I, I, it, it, now that's not to, I don't cast a reflection on it. I just think in my individual case, um, I didn't care to be rape, raping Jackie and Kennedy on, on, on my Facebook, but so I, so I don't. Yeah. And there are a lot today, things like citations and the inability to do the types of things that enable the people who did that to, I mean, who did that to you. So I think this is, I mean, 
unprecedented for raising the issue, but but the, at least some wiser heads prevailed that uh, that something like Wikipedia is great. It's not going to be great if we allow what happened to others to happen to you, and they have taken some steps to do that. It can, it can still be done. <coughs> he's made he's made some real changes, but I'll tell you, there's a an African American comedian named Sinbad. Wikipedia has killed Sinbad more than 100 times. He died from a drug over overdose, a, a drive-by shooting, a heart attack, suicide. Most often he dies because of a place for a birth date. His death date's empty, but again, 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 they fill that. Now, you know, he's, he's alive and viable and, and funny. Uh, good entertainer, a good actor, and... Um, and he can't get it stopped. Now, I'm, I'm sure in my own mind that after I confronted, after Jimmy and I, I had an hour to attack, he had an hour to defend, and then Al Gore moderated an hour with us. So it was a three-hour program, and I got it off my chest. And I'm confident, and as a result of that, that, that Jimmy, has, who's really bright and really smart, and has got that website loaded with valuable information. But I'm sure that in my case, he wanted to stop it, and he has stopped it. But there are still, uh, it's still not that difficult to slide in uh, and to fake who you are and to, um, and to do, and, and to still do damage. Um, but in the final analysis, you know, it really depends upon uh, the institution itself to protect in, in any way you can. I mean, for example, since that five-word biography, I have a biography there now as long as both arms. It's riddled with error. You know, they pick up a piece of information here, pick up one there, and most of it is, is well done. It's not really very harmful to me. It's not harmful at all, and some of it's, most of it is factual. But I don't go there anymore, except occasionally to find out another, another error. But, but I, you know, it's, it's, I'm, it's, I use Wikipedia only as an example to tell you that it is far more widespread than that, and that there are many places and many bloggers uh, who take the same advantage that that those vandals who were on Wikipedia took. I don't want to end this by uh, um, suggesting for a moment that that dark side is dragging us down. I think the bright side here is lifting us up. And the only point I'm making is we just have to be aware of it, and particularly with the young. I agree with you. To the extent that I know what Jimmy has done, I, I agree with you. Well, you all are great to come. This is the First Amendment Center. It is, they, they put my name on the bill, and my grandson, Jack, who was then six, called and said, is this the day they dedicate the building to us? <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, well, can they spell our last name? And they did. <laughs> Thanks for coming to the Seagans Hall Center. I hope that this place, and Bill, you've been here. It's always a great pleasure to listen to talent. And, and, uh, and you know, just to think that you sat here not long ago and Skype gave you another vision, another view, it just reminds you that, that uh, the future is loaded with so many opportunities. It's a wonderland. And we just have to protect it and keep it. Thank you all very much.